Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, session, Improving Healthcare Education Through Virtual Reality. Um, it's already been a great day to be here at this uh, conference, so uh, hopefully we'll have a, a good 50 minutes discussing how we can use virtual reality to improve education within the healthcare sector. I'm uh, Kumar Jacob. I run a small design company in London. Uh, we design and develop healthcare technologies for use in both mental health care and elsewhere. And uh, we, I run a team who are about nine to ten, nine or ten people based in the capital. We have an amazing panel here today to uh, work with you. Uh, First of all, we have uh, Dr. Todd Chang, who is a pediatrician at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. And we have Devi Kohli, who is CEO of a developer based in um, UK. They work with virtual reality and AI products. And we have Dr. David Axelrod, who is uh, also a pediatrician, but he is at the Stanford University. Uh, now, they will all speak for a short while, describing the work that they are already doing with virtual reality in their own fields. After that, we will all have a discussion for about 35 minutes, and then I would like to open it up to, the, to yourselves. And that's most important that you also get a chance to talk to the panel and ask questions and have them answered. Todd? Sure. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Todd Chang. I specialize in pediatric emergency medicine, so I work strictly in the emergency department. And my particular focus is for educational technology, the best practices on how to use the different types of learning materials, whether it's e-learning or all the way up to virtual reality. And what we're going to see here is um, something we've been working on with AI Solving. One year old male found by the mother at home having a seizure. The seizure's been lasting about seven minutes. Blood glucose on scene was 90. Doctor, you need to section that. So this is status epilepticus, which is a life-threatening seizure, and it's a what we call a high-stakes, low-frequency event. In other words, it's something that happens relatively rarely for some people only once or twice a year, but the stakes are so high that it's actually very difficult to teach in that time. Right? If your child is actually seizing, you don't want a bunch of students pondering what to do next. You want the action right then and there. And so we designed this um, with AISoft to address that problem. On that note, Devi? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Devi Kohli, and I'm CEO of AISoft. And, um, we believe uh, we are a UK-based company and we specialize in introducing AI into VR and MR applications. What I mean by that is um, we at AI Solve feel that when you make content intelligent and responsive, it actually takes users, um, it engages more with the users and actually tricks them to get more closer to the reality and th that's what we, we offer at AI Solve. Um, to do this, in fact, we have a team of uh, specialists in UK and India, and uh, in my mind, I, I think of them as a cross-fertilized specialist, I call it, because they come from different fields of uh, technology, right from AI to gaming to 3D graphics, including uh, hardware uh, experts. This really helps them to create an application that is truly what the, the world needs in VR right now. And for my, myself, I, I come from a training and education background prior to co-founding AI Solve. And um, when we started AI Solve, our mission really was about gamifying and uh, creating personalized communications. And that actually moved straight into marketing, to entertainment, and right up to training and education. Um, when I, when we actually heard about uh, Children's Hospital LA project, we were extremely excited because this is where these are the kind of right scenarios where AI makes a true difference. So I'm very excited to be here today. And uh, David? Hi, everyone. I'm <clears throat> Dr. David Axelrod. I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Stanford, um, which means that I take care of um, mostly children, but also adults that have congenital heart disease, so which are 
um, problems of heart malformations that babies are born with. Um, and uh, I worked with uh, a team uh, at Lighthouse to create the video that you'll see in a moment, really to teach and train uh, trainees and also families and patients about a very complex three-dimensional structure. A living, beating heart right in front of them. So they will be able to have a whole new take on how to learn about the heart. We're starting with congenital heart disease, which are structural defects of the heart that people are born with. They'll be able to actually go inside the heart to see the difference between a normal heart and a structurally abnormal heart with congenital heart disease. So that's just a brief clip of what we've created really to advance the education and training of, um, of our groups in healthcare so that they can really understand this very complex um, topic of congenital heart disease. Thank you all. So let's start with a general question saying, what do you, each of you think of the overall impact of virtual reality in the health sector, clinical or research or education could be? Todd? Sure, um, it's a big question, but if you imagine everybody in this audience as well as the panel, we're actually sitting in the center of the Venn diagram where you have a circle of clinical work, circle of research, and the third circle of education. And we're literally sitting in that middle and with the current technology, uh, the current impact, and it could change um, not uh, in the near future, it, there's a sector of VR for patients, for them to experience. And then there's a sector of VR for the providers, the healthcare professionals, the physicians, nurses, whoever you have, so that they can take care of patients better. And those are the current um, domains of impact, if you will, that are currently available. Thank you. Devi? Sure. Um, I think what, when I think about VR, the core of it is, is the fact that it can actually transport people into diff anywhere they want to be transported to. And uh, that, that really, in my mind, makes it an ultimate platform for training. And that's where I see the biggest application of VR. And when it comes to educational VR, I think it's, it's so good because you can actually give you, the learners first-hand experiences uh, of those um, object, learning objectives. Now, in terms of healthcare itself, uh, I, I remember a few years <coughs> ago when I was with this university doing some research within simulation work for medical. Uh, this is one of the U Asia's largest university hospitals and uh, what I observed there was the, a whole group of students in a classroom were actually trying to learn through this mannequin-based training. And whilst it was really hands-on and amazing to get that, what I also noticed was it took a lot longer for, for the maintenance and the, the, the shift changes of those mannequins. And the other in interesting thing was the classroom of 50 or 30 weren't actually able to get completely hands-on with that particular set. So when you th think about scale, it wasn't quite there. And, and when VR came along, I was super excited. Yeah. Thank okay. you. David? It is exciting. I think uh, in healthcare in particular, traditionally, um, I can say objectively, healthcare has been a little bit slower to adopt some, um, some of the advanced technologies and certainly some of the technology that's come out of the gaming world. So I, I see this actually as a real bright spot for VR in that um, there's um, an, an immense amount of interest uh, amongst you know, various groups, research, education, training, um, clinical care. Uh, there's so much interest and excitement in the healthcare community that I think there's a real opportunity to, for VR to make a huge difference in, the, in really in the short term. Thank you. Uh, I mean, especially this audience, we know the experience of VR can be great. But if you're talking about education, there has to be some learning outcomes. So how do you know that people are actually learning and it is actually making a difference? How do you measure it? Sure. Um, so I, we'll give you the, the broad overview plus some specifics that we've been working on at Children's LA. Um, there's about five levels that you can measure outcomes. First, people have to like it, which is usually easy. Second, people have to use it, slightly easy. Then they have to learn something from it, which is either cognitive or psychomotor skills. Then they have to change their behavior positively based on your VR to the actual patients. And then finally, the holy grail is the actual patient outcome changes. It's really hard to get to the top, but if you can start from building blocks in the bottom, you can actually work your way up. So what we've done in the very, very beginning when we developed these modules for uh, status epileptic is it's an extremely stressful situation. And we wanted to replicate the psychological fidelity of what was real 
to the VR world because we felt that experiential learning actually requires that level of psychological input. So we actually measured uh, people's heart rates um, during VR and then also during their regular shifts. And when during a regular shift, if we had an actual patient just like that, we kept going with the measurements. And what we found in both cases, virtual as well as for real, that everyone's heart rates went up about eight to 12 beats per minute. Not very much, but consistently so. Because um, we also don't want VR that's like physical exercise, 30 beats per minute, blah, right? You don't want to overwhelm them in the VR either. So what, we were really pleased with this data because it showed that there was a level of engagement that was represented, cannot be faked, uh, in VR that match that of reality. So I think that's the primary learning outcome and we're building on performance data as we go along. Yeah, thanks. David? That's, that's really interesting <coughs> uh, data that, that Todd has. We, we've taken a little bit of a different approach in that we're not looking for that adrenaline rush as people are, are learning about congenital heart disease. Um, we've focused a little bit more on the actual content um, and then the experience of the educational process as well. And um, we've had a number of learners go through our um, congenital heart experience, you know, the, the, the virtual heart, and actually show us that, yes, you can learn very complex anatomic uh, and physiologic details about the heart um, through this medium. Um, and one of the most interesting things we saw was that even in this um, very somewhat traditional group of um, medical learners, um, sometimes medicine's a little bit stodgy. And when we asked them, would you prefer to learn in VR with a textbook, uh, with an online screen, or even with a cadaver, which is kind of the gold standard in medicine in this transformational experience, 95% um, of the learners said that, that VR was the way that they wanted to learn. So I think the learners that are coming through now are really going to demand this, um, this educational technology. Um, and it is up to us to show that you can actually improve their learning skills from it. Thank you, David. Uh, in the keynote, we were listening to a little bit about AI as well. So if I could ask, is there a place for AI in education in healthcare? Devi? Okay, that's a big topic. <laughs> right. Um, I, I get asked this question quite a lot in different forms. And uh, the one of the things that's really important to think about when talking about AI in training is that um, exactly understanding where and to what extent we need to use it. Because it is really not essential to have AI in every training scenario that's out there. In fact, in most cases, it, or some cases, it can pretty much be an overkill. Particularly because, uh, to put more into context, what I think is um, even a very simple, interactive, non-AI-powered VR, or, or a, including a, a simple 360 film content, can create uh, some amazing, effective results in learning. Um, I think the best example would be just imagine a specialist surgeon who's, who's um, performing a complex surgery, which is probably a one-off situation, uh, and they're doing that in one part of the world. Just having that filmed in 360 would instantly be able to become a very valuable educational tool for someone in another part of the uh, world. And that's super low cost and very instant to deploy. But when it comes to AI, the selection of AI, it's really about choosing it for situations which are very high-pressured workplace scenarios, such as um, the pediatric trauma, as well as a skill-based applied training. And that is where it makes a difference, because when you introduce AI on the content front, you, what you're giving them is a gameplay that kind of responses based on the uh, trainee's actions and abilities, whilst, and that gameplay can, can take them close to the reality. But on the back end, it also delivers great results because then you can give predictive analysis uh, of their performance. So, I mean, that's very important for both self-assessment as well as for external members. Okay. David, do you want to say something from your practitioner point of view? Yeah, I think um, both AI and, and machine learning, I think in certain scenarios, can really enhance um, the ability of the trainees and the learners especially um, to be able to engage in experiences that are very high risk um, and low frequency. So, you know, in my day-to-day -day when I'm, I'm uh, specializing in the um, intensive care unit care for these babies with heart defects, 
um, it's not infrequent that we tell people that you know you need to really know um, what the procedures are that has been performed and you need to be able to walk through in your mind what's going to happen over the next two to four hours to this patient and if you don't understand that then patients can get hurt and so that's why we spend so much time training to understand that um, I think uh, if you can integrate uh, AI into that um, you can really then create a user experience where um, users can really accelerate the learning pathway and get to that point where they understand what's going on a lot faster. And, and I think that's the, the enormous potential of it. Thank you. And now thinking about your experience in doing what you have been doing and ex uh, explaining uh, in the past few minutes, uh, I'm sure it was all smooth sailing and there were no problems and everything happened as they should. But just in case it didn't, what huh? were the main challenge or the main challenge that you faced, Todd? Sure, um, story time. So um, I think one of our challenges among others was that we now have a set of users who are going to use VR that have never used VR before, that are not on Facebook, that just are not technological natives. Um, my boss, who is not watching this because he doesn't know how to use YouTube, um, <laughs> is one of them. He, uh, he's one of those that needs you know, us to open PowerPoint for him. So that's the level of the actual user that you might actually get to encounter. So we created a series of t tutorials, and for research protocols, we decided to just use a tutorial with no medical content, just to get familiar with how the headset works, how the touch controllers work. So we used rubber duckies, um, and you were supposed to move the rubber duckies around and things like that. And we spent a fair amount of time developing the tutorial so that everybody would be on an equal playing ground, but we secretly um, recorded their performance. And what we found is that there is a clear variation in the way and the speed at which somebody can go through a tutorial, whether it's somebody who's basically a VR native and can rush through the rubber duckies like this, or to my wonderful boss, please don't fire me, um, who had a little bit of trouble picking them up and arranging them in the various different tasks. And so what we think that it's happening is that we actually now have this inadvertent handicapping device that we can tell based on a tutorial um, how well they might actually do in the real setting or in the next VR simulation, such that if you know that somebody's performing poorly in a VR training, you need to be able to tell, is it because they just don't get the VR uh, architecture and they are unfamiliar with the touch controllers, or do they actually have uh, clinical decision-making problems that we have to address? So it's actually really useful and a big, um, part of our work to try and delineate between the two different types of performance. Thank you. Devi? Sure. Fr from our perspective, well, you were making it sound like it was easy, but reality with all developers is it never is that easy. Um, particularly, we are, we heard a lot this morning in the keynote, we are just at the beginning, so there's nothing to compare back. Um, so from our perspective, there are probably three things. One of, one of them being integrating a very close uh, pipeline uh, in, and methodology with the collaborative parties, uh, particularly from the subject expert perspective. And uh, the second thing was uh, trying to get in, in, in the, on the same page with all the stakeholders in terms of understanding to what extent do we actually want to introduce AI and, and where. And that was important because every time you're trying to go crazy about introducing AI, there's a cost associated because it adds to the development time. Um, and, and the third thing, and this is probably more relevant to the developers here, is that uh, in my view, I, I think e-learning um, being a glorified version of textbook, I mean, can be interactive, non-interactive, both ways. And when it comes to m-learning, it is the same, but also offers the element of convenience. Now. Now we are at the phase where it is about v-learning, it is virtual reality learning, and it is actually taking people into those immersive spaces. And I feel that there is no shortcut to collaboration in here. It's, collaboration is really the key. So getting that pipeline right uh, is really important. Thank you. Yeah. David? I agree, I think the collaboration is really important. Um, I think, uh, the challenge of, of these collaborations also has, at least for me, led to some of the greatest joys of the, of the process. Um, but there are definitely challenges, and I think that comes from um, two very specialized content experts uh, or groups of content experts that are working together. So, you know, I'm in my, my medicine, very specialized world of, you know, this very specific patient population that I take care of. And then we have software developers and engineers 
um, and also business um, that are working in technology. Um, but to bring those two worlds together has actually been really fun. So the example that I use is, you know, I got these kind of um, relatively extensive tutorials in, you know, what it is to work in Unity and, and what things can and can't be changed easily, which are things that I just never learned in medical school, shockingly, right? That wasn't in the curriculum. <laughs> um, and at the same time, I, you know, we had to build a heart. Um, and so I one day found myself on the Caltrain coming up from, um, from down here up to San Francisco to bring to our uh, software engineers. Uh, I brought six lamb hearts uh, that I went and bought at the butcher and then that's how we you know, taught and we dissected them and went through and learned what, what does a uh, heart valve actually feel like. Um, and so those, those kind of collaborations have actually been really fun, but that's the initial challenge. Um, so I think if you, if you go into it with a mindset of curiosity and, and engagement, it can be really rewarding. It's interesting David said that, sorry, just quickly. When, <coughs> this was a few years ago when my developers were working on a cataract surgery. We had, to, we had to get in cow's eyes yeah. <laughs> to, to try that. So it's funny what all we have to do to, to get that realism in, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so fun. it's unity programming on one side and animal right. eyes and animal yeah. Biology, parts on the other yeah. side. The butcher can be your friend in this. <laughs> and, right. Very much. Um, so uh, coming to the developers, uh, a room full of developers here who might do want to have an interest in this area, want to make a start. Where do they start and what are the things that they should do and more importantly, what are the things that they shouldn't do? David, do you want to go first? <laughs> Okay, I think again it goes back to the point of collaboration, okay. and that's that's really key. And uh, I think um, the other uh, issue is that there's so much of technology out there already. The ecosystem is starting to flood very heavily, very quickly, and uh, the danger there is that if the mar the market the enterprises doesn't understand what really these technologies have to offer and not sure where to start and what to do, then there, there, there's a big problem there. The other issue um, is, is that, um, and often it happens during latest technologies, if then they start to penetrate quite heavily and quickly into the market, there is this whole thing about the developers wanting to jump straight onto the trend and very quickly there is the problem of creating some really bad content mm -hmm. out there. And, and the problem with that is you could potentially kill a, a yeah. great, beautiful technology like we are, or possibly even downplay something like that. So it is very important that we, as we are community enthusiasts, we have to contribute to, to that ecosystem. And it's only very much at the start. <coughs> so I think once we get that collaboration right, uh, we should be able to produce some really good content. Thank you. Todd? All right. So I, I want to piggyback on the idea that as the VR community, um, it's far more effective to create a small product that does one thing very, very, very well versus solving the entire paradigm of all healthcare training all at once. Right? There are many other technologies, like you said. I still have my textbook. I love it. But it does certain things. And for VR and healthcare, it should also do certain things. In other words, your job is not to save the world, although you are going to be part of it, and you just carve out what you can do very, very well, whether it's doing a procedure on congenital hearts or resuscitating an infant or whatever the specialized skill may be, as long as you can do it very well, I think that actually has a greater contribution to health, healthcare and patients, than it is to try and solve all of healthcare at once. Okay. David, do you have a... I think um, for the developers, I would say to do is to keep that element of curiosity and um, to be willing to branch out a little bit from uh, maybe what I would estimate you know, 90 percent of the content out there is, which is entertainment, which is fun and is great. Um, but there is a little bit of a different take and it's a little bit of a different ask for a developer to work in a field where you're actually going to be using this in either research or clinical care. Um, the entertainment aspect that we use in our work, all three of us, is an important part of it, um, but I think it's certainly not the focus, and I think that's where um, you might have to uh, do a little frame shift um, there to think about that. Um, so it's just a change in mindset, I think, that I think at the end of the day, my, my hope is that it's rewarding. Thank you. Of course, as uh, developers, we are very keen to change the world, and we want to do all these things, but we are also in business, so we have to make money. And until now, very much the case was 
working for hire and projects that people like yourselves, Todd and David, are doing. Do you, when do you see that changing where developers can actually come up with products that are monetizable in some way? What do you see the world going to and what can we as developers uh, look forward to? Todd? Okay. Um, so I would reframe it in a sense of value mm -hmm. rather than just monetization because we're, um, unlike entertainment, you are uh, having an impact in some level of healthcare and some level of patients' lives and providers' lives. And that in itself is a unique value that sometimes has a monetization uh, to it and other times they don't. Um, but you can also get to uh, measure the actual patient outcomes. And this is where we would advise you to essentially start looking at data, start showing proof and objective data on how your VR can actually impact, even if it doesn't change the entire world all at once, what are the small increments that you can move the needle forward in science or in healthcare? So as a very concrete example, uh, VR falls into the giant umbrella of simulation education. Right? You're simulating reality for the purposes of learning. Um, and there have been strides in mannequin-based simulation um, that occupy a very different sphere than VR. But in Northwestern University, they were able to use mannequin-based simulation to teach uh, central venous catheter insertions. So they're large tunnels that go into a vein so that we can do procedures in there. And using that training tool, they were able to show that um, infection rates decreased. Hmm? The training tool was $60,000 and it saved on the cost level $600,000 for the hospital system because of the decreased number of infections and the um, decreased number of problems. And that's 10 to 1 ROI, um, which is almost unheard of. And it's the very, again, the holy grail is showing patient outcomes. These are the things that you can do as, as you develop your VR. That's what you want to sh show on the very, very, very end of your, um, the life cycle of your product. Excellent. Divi? Sure. Um... I think, as you mentioned, we are for leisure and entertainment. The monetization routes are fairly starting to become a bit more clearer. Uh, but with we are for training, it's really very, very early days. And uh, work for hire is an obvious one. Um, but again, my fear there is that I feel how are the enterprises supposed to hire when they aren't really fully aware about the benefits that we are could bring in? So it's kind of a vicious cycle because you almost need that validation from the uh, people who are actually out there deploying to, to bring that awareness back into the market. So I don't really see that surge happening quite yet uh, at this early date. But then the other model there that's possible is, is that um, the public and private grants, there are quite a few of them uh, out there. However, um, that then requires quite a bit of an upfront time not just from the developers, but also from the partners to really get that business case ready and go out there for those uh, grants there. Um, the third op way that I look at it is, and which is probably a bit slow, but is, is in my mind, I think it's probably the best way to do it, is actually deliver things in collaboration. Get, get the partnerships together, identify the real skills need uh, where VR can make a true difference, um, and uh, produce content in collaboration that can be out there in an enterprise platform and co consider looking at uh, a revenue share model on a licenses. Um, so that's an, um, a way to go. Thank you. David? Yeah, I agree. I think um, there's a huge opportunity. You're looking at a, a sector that's um, pushing on 20% of the country's GDP and a ed medical education or, you know, or a textbook industry anyway that's a multi-billion dollar um, industry. So there's a, there's a lot of opportunity. I think the key is in that relationship. And um, it's going to be a challenge certainly for the early adopters um, because a lot of it will be sweat equity or work for hire and you know, trying to get the technology into the, into the medical industries. I think actually relatively quickly, um, I would bet within the next few years, essentially every medical school is going to have VR as part of um, their curriculum and part of their training and their pedagogy. Um, I think at that point, um, I wouldn't at all be surprised to see developers start to have formal positions in, you know, at medical schools because um, it just accelerates the process so much faster. Um, and you're starting to see already VR centers pop up at, at um, you know, certain uh, medical schools um, that, that have that relationship already set up. Um, so I'm, I'm enthusiastic about that. Thank you.